Hello, and welcome back to the Five Factors Podcast. We are so glad to have you here. I am Tal Prince, and I am here uh, with my favorite, favorite time management engineer, uh, Matt Adair. Matt, how are you? I am stupendous. I am <sighs> phenomenal. I am fabulous. And there are two reasons for that. Um, on the day that this comes out, I will be in Vail, Colorado, um, God willing, um, at an Acts 29 event with uh, leaders and wives from all over the Southeast United States because it's hot in the Southeast United States. So we're in Vail. More importantly, on June 27th will be my 20th wedding anniversary. And so my wife deserves a tiara. She deserves a WWE championship belt. Um, and so happy anniversary to my wife. Um, and so that is why I'm doing stupendously fabulous today. How are you, sir? Well, I, I, I can't say stupendous or fabulous, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm glad to be here with you, and I, uh, am, I'm, I'm very happy and excited for you. I'm also very, very grateful for Lindsay um, and um, all that she has put up with over the years. Uh, it's a lot. Of them. Yes, yes, it is. It's a great deal. Um, she is a champion. So, uh, yes, uh, maybe, maybe you get her a belt uh, for the 20th anniversary present. Yeah. Um, yeah, why not? Um, which, which again, you know, I mean, we 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 both enjoy WWE. I, I mean, uh, I, I kind of outed her on that, I guess. But you know, we we have been in events and going. How many master's degrees are in this room? Oh, two, two, probably. <laughs> Yeah, probably too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But when I ask, so when I ask people like, what's the weird or absurd thing that you like? I always know what my answer is. You know, I, I enjoy professional wrestling. So there it is. But you know, we're not here to talk professional wrestling or my anniversary today. We're here to continue this conversation that we have every podcast episode, trying to help church leaders build a great church and an even better life. In today's episode, mm-hmm. we want to take this topic that we've been talking about all month long in June about um, how to do great work. And we just want to answer questions that we've been getting. Mm-hmm. Um, so I want to play a little game here first, though, because I'm in a stupendously fabulous mood today. So let's play word association, Tal. There's no telling uh, where this I'm, could go. Yes, uh, I have a, a word, um, and then you're just going to tell me what comes to mind first. So the word is hustle. Scramble. Okay. Um, the reason that I'm thinking about the word hustle is not uh, Pete Rose. Uh, the reason why I'm thinking about the word hustle uh, is because when I think about um, people's approach to work, that I see this a lot more on social media, that I see a lot more of this uh, hardest worker in the room. And oh, yeah. one of the things oh. that I am concerned about is that there's something good and right about working hard. There's something mm-hmm. good and right about having ambition. Um, yeah. But I very much get concerned when I see time and time again that the drive train for so many of us as leaders is hustle. And so one of the uh, one of the things that I'm increasingly convinced is that hustling for us is basically driving us straight into a living hell. And that's mm-hmm. because, well, <laughs> when I, so uh, first off, when I think of hustle. This, this, is, uh, this is a flashback moment for me. So when I started high school in ninth grade, uh, I was deep and wide. I started high school in ninth grade. I was about five foot two and weighed close to 200 pounds. And so I can remember that we had this thing. I played baseball and uh, I can remember that in the fall of my freshman year that we were doing uh, conditioning. And the way that we did this is there was a race. There was a race in which somebody, two people would start from home plate. One would go down the first baseline. The other would go down mm-hmm. the third baseline. We'd see who gets to home first. Okay. Now it was well established already that I was not a fast runner. In fact, I may have been the slowest runner on earth. So this may or may not have happened that um, when uh, the coach said go to me and the other guy who is running that he may have held the other guy by the back of his baseball pants until I got to first base and he still might have beaten me. So for me, when I hear hustle, because that's what I got yelled at a lot, I was going as fast as I could, man. I was just, yeah. I was just the slowest runner on earth. Okay. But when, I, when I also hear the word hustle is when I will come across a leader and I have said things like this in the past, because I used to be the guy that slept four hours a night. Uh, and I said it and I hear it time and time again is that I will sleep when I'm dead. 
uh, I will sleep mm-hmm. when I'm in heaven with Jesus. And I think both mm-hmm. of those, especially the the latters we're talking about work, both of those are extremely dangerous. So yeah. uh, Tao, why is it that um, so many of us as leaders wear hustle like a badge? Um, you know, I, I, it's a great question. I, I think largely um, – it just indicates, I think, we, I think we wear that as a sense of self-importance. Um, it's a way to, you know, look, I, I, the, the busiest guy is the most important guy in the room. Um, you know, I think we have that mindset in our world today. Um, I think it's a flawed mindset for many, many reasons. Um, but I, I, so I think it's, you know, and, and I mean, hustle is very often a compliment, right? I mean, you know, good hustle. We yell it at games. You know, I, you know, I, I yell it to my daughter when she's playing soccer, um, you know, and so it, hustle is a demand that we have culturally. We want people to hustle. We, we prize hustle. And so if I hustle, then I'm prized. Uh, and, and I'm desirable, uh, you know, and I'm important uh, because I'm a good hustler, uh, you know. So, I mean, I think that's, I, I think that's why we kind of tend to want to wear it like a badge. Which was the opposite? You lazy weasel. Um, I mean, it's going to come down to that. It's either I hustle or I'm lazy. There, again, it's, it's, it's a dichotomous choice that doesn't really exist. There's a whole spectrum there, uh, but we just go to, well, either you hustle or you're lazy. Right. And I think probably my, my biggest concern is, is something that you alluded to. And that is that there's absolutely nothing wrong with hustling. Um, I feel like when I watch my boys play sports that I will say that to them, trying to help them find that gear, because if they aren't going to be on the move, like that is a competitive advantage that they have. So there is something good to that. But I do think that this gets into the category that we use in Christian circles of idolatry, where we're taking something that is good and God given, and we basically turn it into a badge. We basically turn it into, this is how um, you know that I matter in this world. And that becomes a very, very dangerous thing because I think, that there, I mean, you can't, you can't keep hustling at some point in time, you have to stop at some point in time, a human being is going to cease to move and cease to operate. We have to shut down and sleep. And so that's our concern within this larger conversation we've had throughout the month of June, as we talk about work and, and trying to help you do your best work. And we said, if you're going to do great work, then every single leader needs to have boundaries. You need to know when you start, when you stop, you need to have, um, you need to be able to have priorities in your work. You need to have focus in your work. And so today we're going to basically talk about the benefits of this different way to get things done. Well, we're not always hustling, but we do have boundaries. We do have priorities. We do have focus. So here's what I, I want to do is I want to take some questions um, that we've been asked some questions that we've come across that I think will help you as the listener to assess um, if your work is turning into a hustle that is going to lead you into this living hell that we described where you're never doing enough to satisfy that voice in your head that says you should be working harder or somebody is outworking you. So Mm -hmm. I would just want to walk through these five questions um, with Tal in the hopes that of helping you. So as you're listening to this, um, process this, you know, in some ways these are yes or no questions. Um, And, uh, and my hope is to give you the permission in your car, walking around in your uh, AirPods, um, that just to give you the gift of uh, honesty for just a minute about where you are in relationship to work. So here's question number one. Question number one is, do you get more excited about work than your family or anything else? This was an interesting one uh, for me, Tal, because uh, it really does get into this area of relational health that we talk about mm-hmm. um, and also our emotional health. So it, it basically ties into my uh, emotional intelligence, my self-awareness, uh, particularly as it relates to other people and other things. So when you hear that question, do you get more excited about work than your family or anything else? What comes to mind for you? Um, that's, that's the start of addiction. Um, it's, it's, I become obsessed with, um, the, my drug of choice, whatever that is. Um, you know, that's what I'm excited about. That's what I'm thinking about. That's got my attention, um, and, and my focus that I spend more time thinking about that than, than, than my family, uh, you know, or my relationships. That's a concerning question. If the answer to that is, is yes, that's a problem, especially for me when it comes down to work, because I think we lose sight of the fact that work was a consequence of the fall. Work's a penalty. 
<laughs> cut it down to its base. I think work is we were never intended uh, to, to to labor. Um, it, you know, it wasn't it wasn't set up that way. Um, and so now we have this whole category of people um, far more obsessed and far more interested in their work uh, than in their relationships, and more interested in, in work more than community, which we're created for. That's an issue. Now, when you think about that in terms of the relationship with work, I mean, so you've got Genesis 1 and 2. They're going to talk about be fruitful, multiply, Adam's out there naming animals and stuff like that. So are you saying that that uh, just work in general is a consequence of the fall? Or are you saying, uh, no, I think that there's a way in which we misuse and abuse work. Yeah, that, um, <clears throat> the way we misuse and abuse yeah. Um, you know, because there's a, there's a lot of our work that is not, <laughs> that, I mean, yes, they had tasks and roles uh, to do hard labor, um, you know, is a, is a different issue. And we're excited about that. And, 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 we're, and we're laboring to labor. Uh, that becomes an issue. Yeah. So as we're sitting here talking about a uh, hustle, uh, what we're, what we are concerned with is that someone's hustle may be uh, a mask for a very real addiction underneath to right. work. And, and we don't throw that word around lightly. Um, mm -hmm. And so we really mean that. And that's really what we're trying to help you do in these questions is mm -hmm. for you to evaluate um, whether or not uh, you are moving towards or you are finding yourselves addicted to your work. So question number one is really about uh, your excitement level. Where do you find pleasure? Um, and do you find that uh, relationally with other people or are you finding that primarily or almost exclusively in your work? Question number two, uh, do you take work with you to bed on, into the weekends or on vacations? So do you take work with you to bed? We believe that there are two things that should happen um, in bed. One of those is sleeping. Neither of those is work. Um, <laughs> we believe that weekends that you are created to enjoy Sabbath and to take a day of rest at the very right. least. And we believe that when you're on vacation, that is a break from work and you shouldn't be taking that with you. Now, um, I remember, and at some point in time in my life, loved the idea. I think it was Seth Godin was writing one time mm -hmm. uh, in one of his books about, you know, being on vacation and uh, sitting in the lobby doing work and somebody walking by him just disgusted, you know, just made some offhand comment that he overheard about, you know, working on vacation. He's like, but I love my life and I love my work. Mm hmm. Yes, but again, this is just talking about boundaries, right? So, uh, Tal, talk to us a little bit about this in terms of just boundaries in terms of when you're working and when you're not. Yeah, you need to have a clear on-off switch. Um, and part of that circadian rhythm, which we've been talking a lot about this month, um, you know, but a lot of that's relational rhythm too. Uh, your family may not love your work. Let's be honest. Um, and, and, and your family certainly doesn't like your work intruding upon their time. Uh, you know, with you. And, and so when you find yourself bringing work to bed, bringing work into weekends, bringing work on vacation, uh, you're squeezing time for your key relationships out. Uh, and it, you're, sending a, you're sending a signal that's not subtle of this is more important to me. Um, and this is where I gain my significance. And this is, uh, this is where I'm, I'm fed and where I'm energized. And so this is what I want to do. Uh, and, and you're, you're going to squeeze your key relationships out. And that's called isolation, which is another part of addiction. Yeah. Question number three, do you believe it is okay to work long hours if you love your work? So why is it not okay if I just really, really, really enjoy the thing that I'm doing it makes me happy. Um, I add a lot of value to people. Why is it not okay for me to just burn the candle at both ends um, and just to keep on working because I'm having a good time. I'm making a difference. Mm -hmm. um, because the research says you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, yeah, Let's switch the drug for a second. And let's go to alcohol and let's ask this, let's phrase up the same question about alcohol. Uh, so, I mean, what is it? What is the big deal if I just like drinking and, you know, and, and I have more fun when I'm drinking and people say I'm more fun when I'm drinking. Um, so what's wrong with me just, you know, drinking every night and, you know, and, and, and drinking a fair bit every night. What's, I mean, what's what could possibly be wrong? Uh, because you're in denial about how others are viewing that. Um, you know, quite largely is, is, is the issue is you think everybody thinks, oh man, he's so awesome when he's drunk. Um, and no one thinks that. Um, and, and you're just not aware of the problem and you losing situational awareness because you become so, um, so honed in, you get tunnel vision for your drug of choice. And when that's work, that's all you see. 
Um, and, and you want to believe that everybody around you thinks it's awesome and wonderful and they're so happy for you uh, and so grateful that you're here doing all of this work uh, when in fact that's rarely the case uh, because people want to be in relationship with you and we believe we're created to be in community and be in relationship and when we're only focused on work that's not going to happen and when we focus on work with a group of other people who are similarly only focused on work you know what's going to happen I, I can tell you uh, th- the, the family relationships of each of those people is going to suffer. And because this person likes the same thing that I like, you're going to get a little bit too close. Uh, I mean, this is how workplace affairs start. That, that, that's just how it goes. Uh, it's, it, it, it doesn't come through nine to five jobs. It comes through jobs where people are spending a lot more time, uh, spending a lot more hours, and their family's mad, but you understand, um, you know, that's how it goes. And so it's a, it's a, it's a really dangerous, dangerous place. Uh, and so you have to have those boundaries and you have to have that focus and you have to have that ability to shut down um, you know or you proceed into very addictive behavior I think a lot of people are surprised to learn there are rehab centers for work addiction hmm. so I'm gonna give you uh, a case study um, and then you tell me if we've uh, discovered um, uh, a unicorn or if this is just a ticking time bomb okay mm-hmm. so here, here, here are all the presenting issues um, somebody who sleeps four to five hours a night, um, wakes up early, goes to the gym because they want to take care of themselves physically. Um, and then they work, uh, 18 hour days. Um, and it is going the whole time. A lot of meetings. Um, they're leading a, a multinational corporation. Mm-hmm. Um, the, they're the CEO. Uh, they are, uh, they prefer extroversion. They love mm-hmm. being around people. They draw a lot of energy from people. Mm-hmm. So it's people, 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 people. Mm-hmm. Family has walked into marriage where there was an agreement that this is the way in which I roll. And if you're married to me, this is how it's going to be. And so mm-hmm. they didn't dupe anybody. It was just up front. They have kids. The kids understand that. They try to, as their kids get older, uh, they can leverage some of their time to be able to be at the, those big significant moments in their kids' development. And, uh, and that person will tell you, I have a great life. I put family first. Um, and uh, I just want to leave a legacy. So when you hear all of that, mm-hmm. what do we got? Uh, uh, denial. Okay. I mean, simply, I, you know, I mean, I, and, and – <laughs> What do we have? A client. Um, that, that's, that's what I have. When you, when you, when you rail that out, I, I have a client. That, that describes a lot of my clients. Yeah. Um, where they're like, look, this was the deal going into the marriage. I mean, she knew that. Um, and this is just how I work. And, and it, it just it just doesn't. It just doesn't. Um, you're not going to have healthy relationships like that. Um, and so typically what I see when I've got someone in that, in that place, I'm often dealing with perfectionism, somebody who doesn't want to do anything other than they believe they do really, really well. And so if they don't trust their relationship skills, don't feel comfortable in their relationship skills or in their relationships, they escape to work uh, because I do this really, really well. Um, and, you know, and, that's a, and that's just a real slippery, slippery problem uh, for, for a lot of people. But that, that, that person is always lonely. Hmm. That person is always lonely. They have very surface relationships because they never have time to go deep with anybody, um, you know. And 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 their family relationships, it just kind of kind of becomes a financial transaction deal. Hmm. Um, we're like, well, we dig the dough. Um, so you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, we'll be cool with everything else. Just you know, keep the dough coming. Um, but I can also tell you, you, you know, how you're gonna when you're gonna find the effects of that type of a life, and and their kids are my clients. Yeah. And their kids are in rehab and their, their kids are traumatized. Their kids have attachment issues. Their kids have addictive issues um, as a result of all of that. And, and, and there's volumes of research out there on, on the wounds of a workaholic parent. Yeah. Um, you know, and what happens, you know, you have a role as a parent. Um, and, and when you're not there to do it, that doesn't get made up elsewhere. Yeah. Question number four. And uh, by the way, if you're trying to keep up with these, jot them down. If you go to fivefactors.net slash work, then um, we've got all these written down. There's a big kind of resource that covers everything we've been talking about this month. But question number four is, is this, um, do you get irritated when people ask you to stop working to do something else? 
Um, this one seems like a fairly common thing and usually it's mm-hmm. get off your phone, pal. Um, you know, it's, it, that, that seems to be the one where I, where I think about this and probably have heard it more than a mm-hmm. time or two from my wife, usually looking at me first, uh, before nudging me and then saying something. So yeah, just short answer the, anything that you get irritable or feel irritation or anger about when someone asks you to stop doing it for a minute, that's a bad sign. Mm. That's just what it is. Yeah. This means you've lost sight of reality and uh, situational mm-hmm. awareness and all those type of things. And you're becoming hooked on it. You, yeah. you're, that's your favorite thing, uh, you know, and someone wants to take it from you and now you're angry and then suddenly you're in Lord of the Rings. And so by hooked, we're talking pretty holistically. I mean, we're talking, you know, there's, uh, you know, chemical hits that you're taking uh, yeah. because of this thing and, and, uh, and, and it's just, it, it's all the way around. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, question number five out of these five questions. And again, we're trying to just assess if, if your hustle and hard work is just leading you straight into hell. If you're just trying to do a little pulse check on where you are on the spectrum, uh, towards, uh, addiction related to work. Question number five is have your long hours hurt your family or other relationships. Um, talk about anything there that we haven't talked about already. Uh, that might be a tell in terms of your relationships with your family, your friends, um, that are being impacted by work. Man, I don't know that there's anything we haven't already covered with that. Uh, um, you know, I mean, I, I dare you to ask your family. Yeah. I mean, that's I think the best thing you can do is, is because you're going to be in denial. And, and, and I know we all like to believe we're unicorns. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so sit down with your family and ask them like, hey, I'm just gauging. Uh, do you all feel like I'm present? Do y'all feel like I'm here when I'm here? Because listen, if you're just at home and you're physically present, but you're not mentally and emotionally present, you're not there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so check in with your, check in with your spouse, check in with your kids and, and ask them for feedback and give them the freedom to give you honest feedback on that. Like, am, am I, when I'm here, do you feel like I'm really here? Um, am I here enough? Uh, you know, do you think I work too much? Um, what would you change um, about my time with you? You know, I, I dare you to ask those questions. Yeah. The one, one other area that I'm thinking about, and this is largely because it's our entire conversation next month is friends. And, um, you know, if you have no friends to talk to about this or have conversations with people who are going to see parts of your life that maybe even your spouse and family don't, then that's probably a tell as well. And we'll talk more about this uh, next month about the importance of friends for pastors and church leaders. Uh, but y'all here, here's the secret that we just want to pass along that you your work uh, is a choice and, and great work refuses to allow work to become God. Um, and there are choices involved because, because there are going to be opportunities to do more and more and more and more work that people are going to applaud. Mm-hmm. So this is going to be a choice that you're going to have to make. And so the choice here is to either choose um, hustle or health. And I don't mean you don't work hard. I mean, hustle mm-hmm. as a way of life. I mean, hustle as a posture towards the way that you think about your world related to work. And so I think it's a choice that's there. And so mm-hmm. um, we mentioned this earlier. If you'll go to fivefactors.net slash work, then um, we basically are taking everything that we've talked about um, this month and we've just kind of put it in one place for you uh, so that you can have some of the resources that we mentioned, um, everything that we talked about in our conversations, so just kind of a one place for you to go uh, to make it simple and convenient for you to kind of dig in and do some work on this. Uh, the foundational principles are fairly simple and basic. It's all about the application. It's all about you doing the work. So we just want to put those tools in your hand and give you a very clean, clear, hopefully compelling reason um, to, to do your best work um, and to know where those boundaries are, what your priorities are, and what it takes to focus and eliminate distractions. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I want you to know, <clears throat> we're, it's, we're not tossing that around lightly. Addiction to work is actually a very real addiction. Yeah. Um, it's called a process addiction. There are substance addictions, that's substances you put in, and there are process, behavioral addictions, um, where the substances are in your brain is what you're after. Um, and so you stimulate the reward loop in your brain, and you feel better, uh, and then you become obsessed with repeating that behavior over and over and over. Um, and that's where you find your significance. And it becomes really easy uh, to lose sight of, of where your significance truly lies because you, you've been, you're significant because of what you do. 
I am my work. Um, you know, and so I want everybody to see how significant I am. So I'm going to work way too much. And then your family hates you. Um, you know, or you've certainly got tension uh, in the relationship. Work is not your significance. Uh, and, and that's not where it comes from. And you've got other roles uh, as, as well. And so, but it's easy to escape challenge. It's easy to escape problem. It's easy to escape relationship at home or with friends by escaping into work. And when that starts to happen, then we've got a real problem. But there's help for that. Uh, you know, there really isn't. It doesn't mean you have to go to residential rehab, though it's not bad. Um, 45 of the best, worst days of my life, kids. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm telling you, uh, we can help with that. I can help you with that. I can help find help for you uh, with that. And uh, it doesn't have to be uh, the way that it is. And you can, and you can get out of that. If you're, if you're sensing that this is, man, that might be me. <clears throat> Excuse me. That might be me man, I need to really evaluate that, uh, let us know. Uh, and I'll be happy to, to do what I can to help you and, and, and guide you uh, to help. So that's uh, what we've got to say about work uh, and work becoming an addiction. And we thank you for the questions, Matt. Thanks for those. Um, so <clears throat> next week, we are going to be focusing on helping you reimagine friendship uh, because you're going to have a lot more time now that you're focused on work and you've got boundaries and priorities and, and, and you're, you're able to have time for relationship. We're going to help you uh, wade into that a little bit better. And until then, go to Five Factors uh, and you know just wherever you get the podcast, subscribe to it, uh, shoot us feedback, comments. They're there in the show notes. You can get to us. We're available on social media. Um, and so, and, and the resource, again, that Matt was talking about, go to Five factors.net forward slash work uh, and get that and go through it. And uh, man, we, we just so appreciate your time uh, and so appreciate your willingness to listen to us. And we look forward to being with you again on the next episode of the five factors podcast. So until then uh, for Matt and myself, uh, we will see you next week.